So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the June 2021 session of the Richmond Art Gallery's Artist Salon series. My name is Kathy Tikolis. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Richmond Art Gallery. I'm coming to you today from my home in Vancouver, uh, which is the ancestral lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish peoples. So welcome to all of you out there watching from wherever you're coming from um, and supporting the Richmond Art Gallery's programs. I'm really happy to have my guest artists here today. We have Puya Kalili and Charlotte Wall, who are here to talk about their work in the field of public art uh, and to provide some tips and inspiration for all of you inspiring artists out there. Um, so for those of you who are new to the program, the Salon is a monthly program. It runs the last Saturday of every month from February to November. It's a combination of professional development and inspiration for visual artists to keep on making your work and expanding your practice. I would like to welcome the artists. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background on each of them. Uh, so multidisciplinary artist and designer Puya Kalili's work straddles the lines between the fields of visual art, architecture, music, and film. Within the realm of sculpture, Puya's work creates a symbiosis between the natural and fictional worlds through public art projects and spatial interventions. Over the past two decades, Charlotte Wall has established an art practice that ranges from standalone works meant for private art galleries to scaled up sculptures placed in the broader public sphere. Primarily a sculptor and installation artist, Charlotte Wall has also worked on a number of public art projects with several pieces installed in British Columbia. So today's guest uh, were recommended to me by our friends over at Richmond Public Art uh, because they will be installing a piece in Richmond in a few months. Um, so I thought it would be great to hear you know, from them about this process of the work that they're making for Richmond. Um, but I also thought it'd be really interesting for artists today just to hear how artists collaborate in the public art field um, as, you know, as well as you know, that might continue in their own private practices but it, I thought they'd be a great inspiration for our audience of artists out there today um, because they have such wide range of work and different ways of working. I think they'll have a lot of great tips for us today on how to professionalize your art practice and in particular your public art applications. Um, you know, so it will help us all just not in terms of public art, but just generally in your art career, uh, giving us some tips and tricks that they've developed over the years. Um, so artists out there, get ready for some great tips and and the sort of process of how you go from beginning of an application to seeing the project through. So Puya and Charlotte, I am very happy to have you here today. Uh, welcome. I am now going to go disappear into the background and I will monitor your questions and comments and I'll come back at the end of your presentation so you can take it away. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Awesome. Good to be here. So <laughs> Yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up. Uh, we just have a short presentation basically about uh, Taifa, which is the public art piece that we're going, uh, we're in the process of making for uh, the city of Richmond. Um, I have a, we have a short presentation here uh, that we'll go through. And then afterwards, I think Kathy is going to open the room up for answers and discussions. Um, so I can go ahead and share the presentation. All right. So, yeah, our, this public art piece is uh, called Taifa, which is a collaborative piece developed by uh, Charlotte Wall and I. We've worked on a few different pieces as well um throughout the years and uh we're really passionate in terms of bringing this piece to the city uh, we come from different fields um visual art design architecture and we are interested to sort of create pieces that um, take on various uh, qualities in those realms um now I am going to talk a little bit about the setting of this piece, which is uh, basically right by the Fraser River. Um, I have, uh, if you look at the circle, that's sort of where we are um, in the city of Richmond. We are right next to the airport and between the two uh, sort of bridges that meet uh, Richmond, number the two, number two road and the number three road bridges. Um, 
And we're right by the Olympic Oval. So if you're familiar with the area, you know uh, that uh, the Olympic Oval is a very large structure uh, there. And uh, so at the end of Holly Bridgeway, uh, there's a cul-de-sac that sort of um, terminates at the, uh, the Greenway, basically, which you can see here. And the Greenway is a pedestrian only uh, pathway, right? That uh, goes across uh, uh, along, the, along the Fraser River. And sort of that's where we are placed for this site. There's a park nearby um, that surrounds the Olympic Oval and the, this public art piece is being developed right um, at that intersection. Um, as you can see here, we have a few steps that connect the street level to the Greenway. And this connection was the site that was provided to us by the city for this installation. So we, this was a given uh, parameter in this project and that's sort of where we started to sort of um, think about this piece. So Charlotte, feel free to jump in here. Yeah, um, I was actually sort of... going to say about the site that um, it was a very uh, contained site in the sense that that's what mm -hmm. we have and it was already, uh, there was a box underneath that had electrical stuff and so on. Uh, so it, we had a very precise point that we could use, which isn't always true with public art. You have a little leeway sometimes, but this one was, and the stairs were there. And so um, this is what we had to work with. And uh, so I just was going to interject that. Yeah, and there was actually a, a pre-built foundation that was yeah. uh, built for in expectation of the art piece that was going to be there. Unfortunately, it wouldn't work for our project, but um, they had sort of, we had to work around that foundation. So it yeah. ended up being uh, more of a challenge than a provision. But um, yeah, so that's kind of where we started. And as you can see, this is sort of where the city meets the nature. Um, the, the banks of the river have been uh, preserved partially uh, through, through the Greenway. And that's sort of where we started to think about this project and uh, what that means uh, contextually. And that's sort of what we wanted to talk about. So one of the interesting facts about uh, this site is when you're on the street level in and around the site, um, except on the Greenway, you don't see the river. Uh, because as you can see here, the Greenway sort of comes up um, sort of as a and bring creates uh, in a way a barrier between the river and the rest of the landscape and it's at a higher elevation so and that means basically when you're on anywhere on the street level or on the surrounding area you don't really uh, visually see the water and we thought that's an interesting point about this site and there's a and sort of walking around the sites, there's, these are photos that are taken from the site, but uh, the taifa, as you know, as you might also know it by, you know, reeds or cattail, as they're called, is a plant that sort of grows um, in and around the site, but it also is a plant that grows when there's any uh, sort of subterranean or even um, overground water. However, when it, uh, it usually grows around small patches of water and through um, sort of time as the plants grow, uh, they um, cover the water, but they sort of always act as a signifier. So whenever you see this plant, you can be sure that uh, they're, they're sort of sitting on top of a, um, a some kind of a water. And we wanted to sort of, um, use this plant as a as a symbol for this existence of uh water and and to talk about the river um uh, these are could i just say too Puya, yeah yeah for sure it shows the taifa uh it for its uh, historical uh, significance as well because it's a plant that existed in this area much before uh any 
you know, any settlements or, or anything was there. We don't know how long it's been growing in this area, but it is sort of an indigenous plant that was always there. So I thought, or we thought that uh, that was important to use a signifier that, that had a historical meaning as well and was more ancient than in anything else, any other plants on the site. So definitely, interestingly enough, I mean, there's also um, um, the, the usage for this plant goes back a long time because uh, the, um, they were used for uh, various uh, uses to as, as insulation in housing or clothing or even um, bedding and stuff like that. So it, it has some very, very interesting uh, uses by the indigenous people here for, um, for uh, and it has a long history. So we sort of uh, decided to use this um, plant as our main source of inspiration and um, sort of use the for formal qualities of it to sort of um, arrive at a form that could, um, you know, be become the sculpture. So I'm going to show you sort of where we ended up first, and then we can talk about the process a little bit. But um, the piece is called Taifa. And there is um, basically three pieces that will be uh, assembled um, in and around the stairs at the middle there. Um, and as you can see, uh, they're going to be created out of um, stainless steel. The, the surface is going to be polished, so uh, they will have a very mirror-like um, uh, finish to them. And the inside is um, created, uh, will we be painted uh, in a yellow sort of golden hue uh, color. And um, they're going to be placed in the landing of the stairs as well as the top level of the stairs, as you can see. And there's a bench component that just accompanies the three sculptures. And um, that's sort of, uh, how big they are. So you can see the figure there for reference to sort of get an idea of the scale. Um, and as you can see, they have slight, um, there's angled slightly in different directions. So uh, when you see them sort of right next to one another, they, um, you can see that the, the slight angled uh, orientations create a sense of movement. And that's kind of um, the finished piece. Now, to if Charlotte, do you want to say anything about uh, sort of the finished piece before we jump into the process a little bit? Uh, well, I think you've covered it. I think, again, uh, by the way we've placed them and angled them, we're, we're going for like a natural kind of sense of the way they actually grow in the water. They kind of grow at angles. They don't, they're not totally straight up and down. And I think we've achieved that with the way we've placed them. I think it, that's an important uh, part of it. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to, talk about the process a little bit. And um, Kathy mentioned that there might be other artists uh, in the audience that might be interested in sort of the public art process that we went through. So, uh, and which usually starts from uh, a artist call. Um, this is a few images of the artist call that we received. Um, the artwork location uh, was uh, predetermined. And we had to sort of work within the parameters of this call. And that's, yeah, so the, we, after receiving the call, we, we responded to the call with a you know, few examples of our past work as well as other credentials. And uh, through a process of um, a selection, a few different artist teams were selected to uh, sort of pitch a presentation of the final piece. Uh, and that's where we started to work on the design of the piece. Um, we started by sort of a survey and study of the site, which included sort of imaging the site from various angles and levels, uh, from ground level 
and aerially. And we also created a, um, a sort of 3D model of the site by scanning the sites with a drone, uh, taking several images and then assembling them into sort of a 3D model that we had of the site, which really allowed us to work with the site and do different iterations of objects um, digitally. So we had a scaled uh, model that we could sort of put any object in and see how it's going to look like and how it's going to interact with the surroundings. We also had to consider all the various um, technical um, limitations that we had to work with from electrical layout to structure. Um, so sort of having looked at all of those things, we uh, arrived at their approach to the site, which was to accentuate the axial bearing of the, the two streets that meet the Greenway and the uh, Hollybridge Road and then uh, create a marker that could sort of talk about the river, but also something that could be um, sort of have a certain aesthetic quality that the residents could uh, resonate with. And um, so that's why we wanted to also create something that had a, a, an intricate feeling, um, much like jewelry that the residents could feel a sense of ownership towards while talking about uh, you know ecological network that exists there and also um, sort of the setting that is um, very prominent uh, obviously uh, it's it can be seen from the river it can be seen from uh, the two adjacent bridges and it can also be seen from the air when you're uh, landing at the YVR airport. So we wanted to take advantage of this 360 degree vantage point and uh, sort of create um, a piece that that works from all various angles, uh, but also can sort of bring a sense of uh, belonging and ownership to the residents. So the design process, um, these are some of the references we looked at. As you can see, um, yeah, there's a mirror, which was a interesting, um, which was an important uh, material because uh, if you look at the site, there's these two qualities at the site that are interesting. On one end, you have the, on the left-hand side, you have a very green, sort of a lush riverbank um, and the water. Uh, but on the other end, you have a very highly developed uh, city landscape. And we thought using a mirror, material could be an interesting way to sort of reflect these images back to the viewer and sort of play on these two uh, very different textures. Um, so we kind of refrain from having, uh, like introducing a new uh, texture to the piece. So sort of stainless steel was a natural choice because we could polish it to become a mirror uh, material. And, but we also um, wanted it to become lighting at night. Uh, it's really important for us to sort of think about a public art piece as having a day life and a night life. Yeah. So lighting becomes a very important factor here. And so sort of looking at lighting and urban lighting, there's this interesting design language of sort of more industrial objects. And um, it was an interesting question to think about how we can marry this uh, more industrial uh, language of, um, you know, a city lights and furniture with a more organic uh, feel of, you know, um, the sort of some uh, a geometry that's inspired by nature. And that's what sort of was the impetus for the design of this piece. So in terms of developing the form, we started off from a very basic outline of this type of plan, sort of an abstract uh, simplification of it. And we just tried um, to sort of see how we can work with the form. Um, it's easy to, you know, end up at a more comedic realm, uh, but uh, with, with the with the form of the plant, but uh, we wanted to sort of uh, create uh, maintain the relative form, but uh, stay in the more elaborate, intricate uh, approach. And 
that's how we sort of arrived at this uh, last form on the right, which is uh, sort of, as you can see, the beginnings of what it came to be. And that's kind of the form that um, more or less sort of is the final uh, form. It's basically a main pod uh, and then the stem. And the stem runs through the form, but the what, what what we've tried to do is create the transitions between the stem and the form uh, and the pod very gradual and very uh, smooth. And as you can see, that's kind of where we ended. Now, this this form, we this uh, we kind of liked uh, how the form looked, but it, it did feel solid. So we wanted to create perforations in the main pod to uh, create room for just visual access to, so you can see through it, but also um, in order to create it, uh, a lighting uh, sort of fixture um, out of this shape, we wanted to be able to house lighting inside. So we did think about perforating the main pod in some ways. We tried a few different approaches, but where we okay. sort of arrived at was uh, is this geometry Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to interject that we uh, we needed to find a way of introducing texture into this uh, form. And uh, yeah. the texture on the real thing, the real Taifa, is like a furry kind of outside. And so we were trying to be be mindful of that and find some way of introducing that texture. And we ended up with perforations, which was really a good thing because then we could have the light coming through. So it was, um, you know, it was sort of a happy coincidence that we were able to achieve the texture and the lighting through the same manipulation. Yeah, totally. Because if you think about it, I mean, working with stainless steel, it's creating texture becomes a challenge. So in order to sort of, um, you know, abstract that the feeling of texture, we decided to sort of use, uh, as Charlotte mentioned, perforations. Now, how those perforations could look like, uh, you know, it's easy to sort of move towards a direction where it becomes too industrial. So we did want to sort of bring it back to a more natural uh, idea. And that's where we started to uh, sort of look at these uh, patterns. They're called Voronoi patterns, which a lot of designers might be familiar with. But these are naturally occurring patterns that happen in, you know, bubbles or, um, you know, cellular growth on uh, leaves or uh, even animal skin. And what what it is is basically a basic geometric phenomena where you know you can uh, you will have a few points as growing as sort of um, origins of growth and then as they grow and they interact with each other they create these cells which you can see on the left hand side a more geometric representation of it and on the right hand side you can see a more smoother uh, organic feel of it so, and these are some of the studies we did in terms of creating these perforations on top of a form. So there's more uh, geometric ones and there's more uh, smoother organic approach. And we, in doing that, we also realized that it would be interesting to sort of create a graduation of these uh, perforations. So at the bottom, you'd have much smaller um, openings. And then as you move, Towards the top, the openings uh, would grow in size and increase. Um, so um, just a look behind the scenes of how these um, perforations were developed on top of the form. This is a software, piece of software known as Grasshopper. So it's basically a way to create um, a procedural geometry basically and the computer and um, I wanted to share a bit of the process so we're using uh, these points as you can see on the left hand side um, as sort of origination growth points uh, for the cell cells and then um, as we move from the left to right we're decreasing from the frequency and then um, on the on the lower part of the geometry 
then we were using those points to create a, a network of Voronoi cells on top of, and then uh, we're basically uh, making them smaller, scaling them down. And um, at the end, we just kind of smooth them uh, and make, make them uh, a much more of an organic feel. And that's how we arrive at the final form. So this is kind of, uh, as you see here, this is how the sculpture will look like, as we showed earlier, um, the, the, the transitions on the bottom and the top are quite smooth. And um, the inside would be painted yellow. And as you can see, the thickness that um, is sort of the wall of the of this piece will also be painted yellow. And then it would uh, terminate at the top in this smooth uh, stem. And at the bottom, it will terminate at a very clean uh, glass um, landing, which is also a light that, that illuminates at the very bottom. We really wanted to get away from having a bulky uh, sort of base for the sculpture, which I think takes away from the aesthetic qualities of it. So that's sort of uh, how we're uh, attempting to terminate the piece. And as you can see at night, it will have glow uh, both inside and at the base. Um, that should look nice against the dark sky. And that's sort of the, at the base, we have this lighting assembly that I want to show a little bit of the inside of because it's quite a, um, quite a piece to sort of bring together both the structure, the electrical components, and the other variable components that create this uh, lighting fixture at the bottom. And yeah, that should be the effect, hopefully, once we're finished. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, that's, as you can see, that's kind of the process we took. Were you, uh, Puya, so, were you going to show, uh, we just got an image from China, the first few pieces that they have uh, created. Uh, and uh, we have a... Yeah, yeah. Do we have... Yeah, to so I have a brief overview of the, of the fabrication process. So basically how these are going to be made, uh, except for the benches, is... Um, these are some of the shop drawings that we're work, we've worked on with our fabricators. So they show the various aspects, which might be interesting for people who would be looking to do something like this. There's a lot of uh, technical issues that need to be resolved from electrical conduits and cables to structural components. And um, it ends up being quite um, more than what you would think initially. But uh, in terms of the forms, the basic the process is that uh, from a digital model, a one-to-one -one foam model is created. And that foam model is basically used as a basis for creating the final piece. This is a piece that was done in a similar fashion. Uh, this is a piece that Charlotte had worked on uh, earlier. It's, a, it's already installed in Olympic Village. And it has, it's using this, a similar process. Uh, so it's sort, of, sort of going from a one-to-one -one foam model, a digital model to a foam model, and then to, um, in this case, a cast stainless steel object. So these are some images that we've recently received from our fabricator um, in China. So these are, uh, one, this is a one-to-one -one foam model that they're working on. Um, we, as we were moving into production with this piece uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, COVID hit us. So yeah, and with for uh, in terms of our fabricators being in China, that was a quite a setback for a few months. Uh, I was scrambling and sort of figuring out what to do, but we're back in production and hopefully um, we're aiming to have this piece installed um, very early fall. So. Uh, that's kind of our timeline and hopefully you can see it at that time and yeah that was it um i think 35 minutes so um if um that's kind of thank you for being with us and uh if you have any questions or comments or and i don't know how kathy is going to handle it but there might be a, if, if it's 
uh, we can have people up for discussion as, as well. Sure. Well, great. That was that was great. A uh, great overview uh, for everyone. So we do have a few questions, and I'll just go through them with you, and uh, we can go from there. So the first one uh, was from Lauren. How do you both approach the design process when collaborating with one another? Okay. Well, uh, should I go first? Sure. <laughs> uh, Kuya and I have worked together for a, a long time. He has done the digital part of my, uh, a lot of my own artwork. And uh, we were in the same studio for many years, actually. So uh, we got to know each other's work very well. And um, we were looking for uh, commissions, public art commissions. And so we were keeping our eye out for calls. And when this one came, uh, it looked interesting. And we, we because of our different, we have slightly different backgrounds. Uh, Kuya is an expert at all the digital work and technical stuff, and that, and plus he's a great designer. So um, he brings all that to the table. While I am, I've had uh, quite a lot of experience with actually making artwork and doing public art. And um, and so I guess I bring more concept maybe and uh, knowledge of materials maybe, uh, but it's a good partnership because we both bring different qualities I think to the work, but we both have the same sense of, of what we want a piece to be, how it should read for the public and for the world. Uh, so, we are very passionate about it being uh, excellent and meaningful. So go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and definitely uh, working uh, from in, in the same space is also in, uh, helpful because, you know, there's so many ideas that you can just easily, um, you know, send back and forth and work on mock-ups. Um, we actually did do a few mock-ups uh, using different materials. And towards the end, we had a one-to-one, -one, oh, not the one-to-one, -one, we had a scale model. I have a, one of the pieces here that we 3D printed. So, and then, um, yeah, having sort of these um, actual physical resources is a big help. Uh, usually we find that you can just basically um, if you want to cut something and show it, which uh, it, it's just um, so much easier in person, <laughs> a lot harder when working remotely. But yeah, gladly when we were developing this piece, it was before the pandemic. So um, working at the same studio was also an um, easy way to sort of uh, collaborate and communicate. Yeah, we were very lucky that uh, we had actually finished uh, the design and, and the fabrication ideas and so on just before COVID hit. So it really was almost ready to go. And so it was just a matter of waiting until China could get going. And so it was lucky that way. Great. Um, a question from Cindy. I live in Edmonton and a sculpture was made with silver polished stacked balls. There is an issue with it. Where it was placed on the side of the white mud, when the sun hits it, it becomes quite blinding. Was this something that was taken into consideration when developing your design? Yeah, so it's an interesting point. Um, it Working with reflective materials outdoors is important. Uh, when you're doing that, it's important to definitely take into consideration sun and reflection. So if you are uh, if you have a flat surface or a concave surface, it, you know, working with a reflective material can be quite challenging. In in our case, we're using with a com uh, we're dealing with a convex surface. So as you can see, there's um, this any rays of sun hitting the material would be would disperse. Uh, so you will never have sort of a con. Uh, con rays or in and sort of a flat. Uh, material case, sort of a mirror setting. Um, 
so yeah, because because our form is basically concave all throughout, even on the more flat side, we have a slight curve to it. So um, you would always see a dot where if if you're sort of at the right position, but it would never be more more than that. And the, I think the, uh, the perforations in it to uh, you know make it much less blinding in in any way. Hmm, great. And yeah. in relation to that, another question: How did you come to deciding the light levels and the number of perforations? Um, the perforations are basically uh, enough to sort of cover the piece uh, from all angles. Um, and then, as you can see, as we go up in the piece, there is more uh, openings. Um, I actually don't even know how many perforations there are. We just basically uh, did it visually so that it just looks looks right. Uh, the, um, so, and as I showed you, I mean, working with a per per parametric sort of environment allows you to tweak things back and forth. So we basically yeah, we're working with sliders and sort of fine tuning the piece. Um, it's it's purely visual. And um, I don't even know how many there are. It looks like <laughs> maybe uh, about 100. Um, and light levels, we basically have to um, adhere to standards in terms of uh, street lighting. Now, this is not, a it's not going to light up the surroundings, but the, it, it, the light will light the piece itself. Uh, so it's actually um, a very, very uh, graceful lighting at night. It, it's not something that has uh, sort of a, it's, it's not a light fixture, obviously. And um, something we have to also look at is the light. Um, temperature so we are using very very low temperature lights uh, so when we talk about temperature it's not the actual heat level but the the color of the light you you would say so um, we're uh, so the, the, these are basically very warm lights warm looking lights uh, so at night they should um, in addition to the um, yellow color should create a very very warm feel to it which hopefully we should feel good when we have uh, long rainy <laughs> evenings. <laughs> yeah, those winter days. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Glenn asked a question. I know he asked it right before you were talking about the fabrication. So I'm not sure if we fully answered your question for you, Glenn, but he was asking, how is the fabrication being done? So it's actually, uh, yeah, the fabrication for this piece is a very interesting process uh, called panel beading, um, where the, uh, as you can see, the piece is being uh, segmented to much smaller pieces. Um, and then uh, each piece, um, so you, you're basically working with sheets of metal that are very small. And um, it's a very labor intensive process because the she these sheets of metal need to be hammered uh, so that they follow the, the form uh, precisely. Mm -hmm. So um, they're basically, it's, it's a very manual process uh, as opposed to like the, how we came up with it, which was very digital. But yeah, the fabrication is very uh, labor intensive and manual. And that's why there's a, China is one of the only places in the world that uh, is has real, uh, has uh, experts in that field. So uh, we're working with one of the largest uh, fabrication um, warehouses there, uh, the fabricators there, and they they've really perfected this technique where they can make massive um, sculptures from it. But um, it has its own. Uh, you know, sort of expertise and um, knowledge base that is uh, mostly concentrated in China. It cannot be cast uh, because, uh, as you can see, um, casting it would would create a much heavier piece that would also be compromised in terms of um, structural structurally. So we have an in structure that is inside the piece, and then the the sheets of uh, stainless steel are going to be sort of wrapping around it. And that's how it's done. Great. And Glad says, 
Thank you. That's amazing. He also said it looks great. What was the budget? Not, so the budget was uh, <laughs> the budget was a lot less than what we needed, uh, um, but it was preset by the city. Uh, it was the city of Richmond? Uh, it was part of a um, development project that had, was done earlier, um, and the, the total budget for the piece is uh, three hundred thousand dollars. Just to stay here at this point too, if, if there are people in the audience who are interested in uh, applying for public art, uh, one thing that is always true, um, it's very hard if you have a good idea and a good piece that you're pitching. And even when you've worked out all the numbers and everything and you think you can do it for example, 300,000, it's very tricky to actually pull that off for that amount of money. And I've done, I don't know, maybe I've done 10 public art pieces. And uh, so I'm just saying, if you're in it for the money, uh, I haven't really made any money. So uh, doing public art, but what I do think is uh, my reward, if you wanna call it a reward, um, for doing this work is the fact that uh, I feel I've contributed an excellent, significant piece for the city and that it exists and it will uh, continue to exist. So saying this, I'm certainly not saying you shouldn't try to, you know, get some money out of it to make some money, but uh, it's hard. It's very hard to, to make money with public art, but um, uh, it's, it's yeah, and it, it tends to be a very tough thing to estimate because when you're developing a piece, you want to be sort of free in terms of what you're, you know, creating. And it's really hard. I mean, usually you're also working with a very uh, tight timeline, you know, from the time you get picked, usually until when you have to present, you may have a few weeks or a few, like months or so. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a very hard process because on one end you you're creating you're modifying things but any move that you make has uh obviously budgetary repercussions and sometimes ones that you cannot foresee because there's so many different elements i mean you might be able to get a code from a fabricator but then there's so many auxiliary things that go into it from you know structural uh, requirements, electrical requirements, and there's, you know, you need to, you know, in install it, there's installation, there's move, uh, transportation, there is, and, and yeah, there's always surprises. And our experience has been that it's always going to cost way more than your estimates. So it's a very, very tough, um, yeah, as Charlotte said, very, very tough to um, come out the other end without holes in your pocket, for sure. <laughs> I've definitely heard that from pretty much any public artist I've talked to. It's, it is, yeah. and I think especially your first few where you don't have that experience quite yet of figuring out how much things are gonna cost. So yeah, I've heard that a lot, um, which relates to yeah. Rick, Rick's question, which I think is a great question. Uh, Rick is saying one of the biggest knowledge gaps for a lot of artists is in the area of installation design rather than concept. How would you recommend artists fill that gap? Would it be partnerships with engineers and designers? Um, or, I mean, are there courses or mentorships out there that you know of that could maybe help artists fill that gap? Because I do think that's a that's a big mm -hmm. leap from coming up with the artistic vision, then how do I, how do I then get it done? Yeah, it's true. It, there is a very big gap. And the gap is partly installation, but the, but the bigger part of it is actually uh, fabrications, so understanding how you're going to create something. Uh, and as the scale grows, there's so many other things that come into play. Um, certainly working with, uh, you know, different uh, consultants is a big import, uh, issue. We had, uh, just to give you an idea for, for this project, we definitely worked from, with a structural con consultant from the very beginning. Um, and we've had two different fabricators. Uh, that are doing the benches and the and the plant and the, the main sculpture separately. Then there's a, 
electrical engineers, uh, there's uh, civil engineers. Uh, so we had to do a study of the dike and the uh, water uh, processes that affect the site. So there's a lot of things that might not at all be on your radar, you know, sort of uh, soil uh, restrictions and like all of these things. So yeah, definitely you, you'll probably need to work with several consultants and picking the right consultants can always be a big lifesaver. Uh, so, um, you know, and that's when you will have to sort of uh, think about, you know, if, if that consultant has done a similar job before, especially when dealing with art, because a lot of these consultants or, uh, you know, various trades might not have dealt with uh, art pieces and something that might work in, you know, construction might not necessarily work with an art piece as we've <laughs> learned through many damaged pieces and uh yeah so it's it's a tough thing it's also very hard to find the right people because there are not many um there are not many you know sort of dedicated trades um that work only with art it it, it as as it's also helpful to work with fabrication companies there are a few uh sort of art fabricators that sort of do a lot of the uh, more technical sites for you. Um, but you would have to have an, a good understanding of the materials you're working with and whatever goes into it. So it's very different to build something out of fiberglass than is to build it out of stainless steel and, you know, working with, um, you know, wood is very different than metal. So you would, I think experience is key it's hard to say uh what it would be a good course of study but um yeah maybe other public artists would could be a interesting you know uh, could definitely help out uh, i'd be happy to help anybody if they have questions um yeah or we to, to the extent of my knowledge yeah. yeah and we might be able to recommend uh there are fabricators who who work well with artists and but I think the bottom line is that uh, you really have to do a lot of homework and research, like of trades and whatever else you need. Uh, you're not going to be able to just go out there and you know pick somebody, and you have to sort of look at what they have done and uh, talk to them, interview them, and see if that's going to work for you and get prices, of course. What, yeah. Know, so yeah. It, it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of background work that isn't really necessarily about art. I mean, or what we call art. Uh, it's it's about technical things and fabrication and getting it done. So yeah, but it's important to know it so that it doesn't compromise your art, right? Yeah. The last thing you want is for your piece to be value engineer then cut down and you know at some point there's a point where it starts to not look like your intention at all and to yes. to work around that you want to be you know uh, in control of all the various aspects that go into creating something like this yeah absolutely great well in connection to you know sort of your careers as public artists uh, lauren asks what percentage of your respect respective practices is dedicated to public art well i it's a good question <laughs> yeah. i mean uh if you're talking about uh public art that's generated by cities or contractors or that kind of thing uh i've done three in richmond and one in South Surrey and several in North Vancouver, one, two in Vancouver. So it's quite a few, about 10, I'd say. And, and how, how yeah, long but, do you work on like one project like that? I know it's, and it's not dedicated like every day for a certain time, but just, you know, on average, what would you say, what's your time dedication to a, to a project? Oh, that's an impossible <laughs> question. <laughs> it's, well, there's a crazy time dedication. <laughs> yeah, uh, because like any artwork, you know, your thinking time is a lot of time. 
and then you're talking and interviewing and you know all that time I, I I just couldn't put a timeline to it but usually uh, you have uh, we usually had about a year to complete a piece so um, usually that's they they need it by then uh, having said that you know I had a piece ready a couple of winters ago when we had all that snow and it was supposed to be installed in October and the construction wasn't ready. So I finally, uh, they asked for me to bring the piece there in late December, which I did. And then it snowed, we had this huge snowfall. It was buried in snow for a month and a half. So it, you know, which is not where a good place for it to be. But these are the kinds of things that do happen and you just have to be patient and uh, you know try to work with it and uh, I mean it, it finally did get put up and everything but so these things when when you ask about a timeline it's you can say like usually it's about a year that you have but it could be three years so yeah, and it's a very stop and go process. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, you're working very intensely for a few weeks, then because you're dealing with so many externalities, you know, from, uh, you know, permit bodies, you know, where is the city or other, you know, government organizations, then you're dealing with a lot of other externalities. So there's like, uh, at points, you're very you know focused on something then you can you'd have to wait for some process to finalize whether they're building something or installing or uh, so it's a stop and go process and it can take as charlotte said a year two years uh, so uh, it's it's really hard to sort of manage a single public art piece you might want to have a few that are sort of working in concurrently um um but yeah, it, it can be a drag, but it depends how you manage it. And in terms of per, uh, percentage, um, my work, um, most of my work is in uh, other fields of design, architecture, um, and um, the various other things. So public art is as a, a, maybe a 15, 20% of the work that I've done or less. And uh, yeah, certainly for Charlotte, she has her practice as well that uh, is not necessarily centered around public art. So um, yeah, I, I don't, there might be people who are full-time public artists, but I, I don't, I don't know them. <laughs> I don't know any, it's it, it, certainly you would need the many projects uh, to happen at the same time, but um, there, it's very different from an art practice because there's so many elements that are out of your hands and both time-wise and, uh, you know, um, other, other aspects as well. Great, thank you. Another question. Um, so thank you for the inspiring talk. Could you offer advice on presenting your concept to a selection panel uh, who comprises of many backgrounds and beliefs and perspectives on art? And maybe, you know, in connection to that, you can talk about the different, I mean, there are different uh, ways public art is funded and, and found, you know, whether it's through a city or whether it's through a private developer. And just if, if there is a difference between those processes, if you could just let address that for a bit? Well, uh, I think what we've found is uh, on the brief that you get with the call, uh, they, they do talk about things that are important to them. And uh, you have to address those things, of course. And uh, you have to convey a sense of, uh, of enthusiasm and passion about it. And, and you have to be able to give them the feeling that you're going to give them something that they're really going to like or appreciate. And that is partly just having uh, done some homework and uh, being able to present it in such a way that it's palatable and understanding to the people that you're talking to. And usually, I mean, yes, there are you know, different 
people in, in different, every committee, but uh, usually what they want to know is uh, the same things. They, they want to know if you can provide it at the budget they have and can it be, you know, compelling and interesting and they all want sort of a wow factor, which is often difficult to give with the, the button. But um, yeah, you just have to, you do have to be enthusiastic and very genuine about why you're doing it. And that has to be true for yourself too, because unless you are really passionate about doing it, and I, I, I would say there's just no point in doing it because certainly it's not money. So, yeah. Yeah, in terms of the first question, I think uh, you want to leave as much um, away from guessing as you can. So, uh, it, you, so that's where renderings really help. But that's where having a physical model really helps. You know, that's where having maybe a, even a sample of the material really helps. So, uh, in terms of presenting, creating convincing presentation, you want to uh, people to have a very clear idea of what you're going after. So, using multiple ways of sort of bringing that, that out, uh, sort of clarity is definitely helpful. Um, and in terms of the different processes, yeah, usually public art projects that we've worked with either um, are done through a developer or directly through a city, uh, through a municipality. So, and my understanding is at least in Canada, um, there's a, a, usually a, a percent, percentage of the budget for any development that has to go towards a public art project. Sometimes it's different, but um, yeah. And you're either dealing with uh, the developer that is, um, building the project and they're, they're uh, basically taking on the management of that public art process or you're dealing with the municipality directly. And there's, yeah, there's definitely things to uh, watch for in both of those scenarios. They tend to be very different. Um, when you're dealing with a developer, there's um, most of the time a, a building is also being constructed at the same time. Uh, or there's a project that's happening at the same time. So you really want to be careful with the timing around those projects because they do tend to shift a lot. And like Charlotte was mentioning, uh, there was a piece of hers that had to sit outside for several months before they could install it because they basically were off on their timing. And um, it's tough to have them manage it because... Um, on, on that instance, the way they managed it was very poorly. But um, so, yeah, whereas where, where you're dealing with a municipality, you're probably responsible for mostly everything. Uh, there tends to be a higher sort of amount of communication that is needed, I find, in terms of working with a municipality because there's many different parties and uh, that you have to respond to and just have to, know um sort of what every um department does and what they're looking for so yeah um and that's outside of those two can't think of any other situation that we've had to deal with um in terms of public art but they do tend to be very different yeah right do you have a preference for either one <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, yeah, really depends. I think it's a very, it's very different. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a, like a third version because there was a piece that we were in talks with in Edmonton and they were representing a, sort of a community. But yeah, it's, a, I, th I feel like developer projects tend to go faster, but there's more room for error. So wow. depends on what um, yeah, and I think what what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I think each each project is kind of unique. You know, it, it's hard to say that one group is yeah. easier to work with than another, but because each each project is is just unique to itself. Right, right, and just. 
thinking about as an artist working with all these different parties and inter, you know and people I'm sure there is compromise that has to come along the way so do you have any sort of tips or advice for artists on how to how to work with that um because I'm sure you know ideas change timelines change um things you didn't like you said earlier in your talk like things you didn't even think about or something suddenly you have to know a lot about so how do you how do you how do you deal with that compromise that's always going on yeah there's a lot of compromise for sure i think yeah. a lot of it comes from the fact that you're um um like different from the way many artists might practice doing public art you rarely are the person uh creating the piece so you, being familiar with that process is important because that's where you know a lot of compromise can happen and then another area of compromise is when you're dealing with things like structure and you know um whether or not you know this piece will need um you know other time forms of support so, you know so i think doing um a lot of homework um and front loading the work definitely helps uh, because if you're if you want to figure things out in the process, you will have to be ready to face a lot of changes, which often mean compromises in the not so uh, desirable. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, you know if if you always consider that there are co some compromises you can make, but uh, as long as you can sort of hold on to the integrity of the piece and you don't have to give up on on that part of it then I think you can you can make compromises but there's definitely a line where you have to say no that won't work that that isn't going to tell the story as I see it so um so it's a matter of of uh, making those decisions and you know, and still having what you in the end envisioned. So it's, uh, yeah. Great. Well, yeah. I don't. Holding our, I was going to say holding on to the, the initial vision really tends mm -hmm. to be the main thing. Like you have to sort of hold on to it, be able to say no to a lot of situations and fights in a way to have it done, you know, closer than further from the vision. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I mean, this has all been really interesting and informative. Um, we don't have any questions. So one thing I was just going to ask both of you to end on, if there's one piece of advice you could give to someone who's just starting or thinking about starting on this field, uh, what would be your one little tidbit of advice you wish you had when you were first starting? Hmm. Yes, well, uh, I guess I would say, like I've said before, that uh, it's very rewarding to do because it exists once you're finished. Um, but be prepared to do a lot of hard work and, uh, and to engage a lot of people that you need that you can't do without. So... <laughs> Yeah, I think my advice would be to sort of, uh, if somebody's interested in the field, definitely work your way up uh, in terms of scale of the project, because there's a point where, you know, as you, as project increases in scale, uh, the complexity also increases. So it might be a good idea to get familiar with sort of building something out in the open uh, on a large, smaller project with less variables and um, sort of, you know, allow yourself to adjust to all the other elements that might be unforeseen. And then you can scale it up um, as you go forward. But scale does tend to make things uh, more complex, complicated and complex. But that shouldn't be a factor to stop anybody for sure. Uh, so yeah, yeah, doing it would be the best way to, you know, get familiar with the process. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, thank you. That was great advice. Um, as a lot of people are saying in the comments, it was an excellent presentation. And thank you for all your inspiration and all the information you shared with us today. Um, so thank you both for being here. And thank you to the audience for joining us on this sunny summer day. Um, I want to also thank um, Melanie, who's behind the scenes, making sure all the tech is working for me. Um, she will also be working on editing this as a video, so it will come out soon if you did want to rewatch this again or share it with somebody. Um, and while you, and that will be available on our website very soon. Um, and while you're visiting the website, I also want to invite you to our next artist salon, which will be July 31st. If plans go as they are, we will be doing this in person. So this potentially could be our final live stream for the salon for this year. Um, and hopefully you can all come back and join us and meet in person. And we'll get back to the social part of the artist salon that I know I miss. And <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us out there are missing. Um, so, and just again, thank you everyone out there. Thank you for all the nice comments and for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Charlotte and Priya for such a generous and informative presentation. Um, so I will sign off for today. So thank you everyone. Take care and I thanks hope we'll Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, and everyone else. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.